Hello, and welcome to the ongoing online versions of Music Humanities for Spring 2002. Hi, I'm Brad. Um, this is going to be the class uh, to listen to for Tuesday, March 31st, and we'll have our online session then with Zoom. I'll be sending you all the information after a while. Anyhow, uh, this one, uh, we're still firmly in the Romantic era, and we're taking kind of a pause out of the kind of the general flow of the different composers we've been talking about to talk about one particular composer, Richard Wagner. Okay, born in 1813 in Leipzig and died in 1883. Had a pretty good life, um, but kind of was raised in Dresden. Um, had kind of a mean dad, sort of like Beethoven, but um, he was... He was quite a person. Um, I have a lot to say about him. Um, for me, he's one of the pivotal figures in this whole music humanities exercise that we're doing. Um, and I mean pivotal not in necessarily a good way. Um, it's funny. He, uh, well, 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 we'll talk about kind of his involvement with things in, in a bit. Um, but don't get me wrong. You need to understand how powerful a figure he has been and the influence that he has exerted upon our culture. Um, literally, he revolutionized music. I'm not making that up. We're, we're going to get to that in a little bit. And he also revolutionized the presentation of music. Um, he was most famously known for his various operas. Um, and you've probably heard of some of them, you know, the ring cycle, you know, we're going to be talking about that. Um, uh, Tristan and Isolde, Parsifal, you know, all these, all these famous works, you know, Wagner kind of did. And through his operas, he basically, he basically set the culture for entertainment, kind of mass entertainment as we know it in, in, in kind of a direct way. Um, first of all, he had a challenge. You know, he wanted to do these operas that were kind of all-encompassing and were kind of complete. He called them, okay, uh, here's a word, Gesamt, am uh, I spelling it right? Kunst, Gesamt Kunstwerk, okay? Or totally encompassing works of art, okay? He basically felt that when you went to see art, you had to be transformed. This whole idea of catharsis, you know, going back to the ancient Greeks, you know, you had to come out of his operas transformed, highly romantic kind of sentiment, you know, but he worked hard to kind of achieve that. And he had a challenge, you know, basically he started really merging theater and music in a way that no other person had done. You know, obviously we talk about Mozart, we talk about, you know, Salieri and his operas even, um, uh, and the kinds of things they were doing. But Wagner was the one that created opera as we know it. The idea that there's an ongoing, like, play that's being enacted through music. That was Wagner. And he had a challenge. He had to come up with a way of having music that would be ongoing throughout the opera but would have enough of a form and a shape that it would kind of tie things together. Um, you know, he couldn't rely upon sonata form or fugues or anything like that because he had to write music that would basically propel the dramatic and narrative action of the opera forward. Um, so he came up with this, with this approach that you will find very familiar that he called composing with light motifs. Okay, these are little fragments of music that can represent a character, a person, an idea, you know, a, a general kind of theme. And you've heard what a leitmotif is. Okay, I'm going to play you a couple right now. Um, here's one. You know, every time you hear that, you know that Aragorn is going to appear on the scene and rescue everybody, right? Even if he's not there right now, it represents the thought of him. Here's another famous one. Ah, sorry about the mistakes. It's a little hard for me to reach the keyboard. Uh, it's a little bit bizarre down here. But anyhow, that's the idea. I mean, Darth Vader. You hear that music and you know, oh, Darth Vader is being thought of. Darth Vader is evil. Darth Vader is going to come and he's going to breathe on us. 
you know, all that Darth vader stuff. And, you know, it's through movies. Basically, Wagner invented movies. You know, these light motifs, it's a way of putting everything together, keeping the drama going, and, and really making it work. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about this. Wagner was explicit about his... He's trying to do this. He wrote a number of essays. In fact, I mentioned earlier that we're going to kind of get to some of his uh, his his stuff. When I talked about Robert Schumann and Brahms and Clara Schumann, and they had kind of this society, and Schumann published that weird um, Neue Zeitschrift für Musik, you know, which was about you know the stuff that he thought was important. And I said, you know, he kind of was in opposition to Liszt and Paganini. Well, Paganini. Well, well, sort of. He was really in opposition, and they were all in opposition to Wagner because Wagner represented the opposite side of Romanticism to them. He, uh, we're going to talk a lot about Wagner, his, his stories, and his life. Um, but uh, Wagner rose to the challenge. He also published a lot. They had literally an academic war of words going on. Wagner published essays, Art and Revolution, and The Artwork of the Future, where he talked about his ideal of unifying all works of art through theater. And that, again, that Gesamtkunstwerk, you know, the idea that you really, you know, you had to experience something. Um, and that was kind of counter to what uh, the craftsmen and Brahms, you know, the, the elegant kind of personal statements of Clara Schumann, you know. Um, Wagner represented the, the badness of the Romantic era for them. Of course, for Wagner, it was the same thing. And it's funny because this played out um, all over Europe. They formed these Wagner societies that championed Richard Wagner. Um, it, was, it was a very kind of strange thing. Anyhow, so Wagner did all this stuff, um, he, uh, and he did, he did more. Um, he revolutionized the presentation of music. When I said he kind of set, the, set the, uh, the format that we now enjoy as entertainment, basically, first of all, he greatly increased the size of an orchestra. He invented new instruments. There's instruments called Wagnerian tubas. You'll hear some of them in a little bit. Um, that, uh, that he used to round out the fullness of the orchestra. Um, he also changed the, the way that we think of an auditorium. Um, he had a chance, uh, working with uh, Mad King Ludwig of Bavaria, to create his own opera house. And it still exists today. Um, we're going to talk about that later. Um, but it is in Bayreuth, Germany. Uh, when you go into a, a, a movie theater... And it's kind of raked upwards so that the back seats are higher than the front seats. And they're kind of like scattered around in, in a very Greek sort of way, but uh, done, done kind of to maximize the sight lines to the stage. Um, that was Wagner. You know, he, he kind of said, this is how I, I want everybody in my audience to have the full experience. You know, he really was concerned about those things that we call sight lines and stuff like that. You know, and, and, and finally, he, he also was very involved with the acoustics of his theaters. He wanted things to sound perfect from every point in the theater. Um, he, uh, you know, if he had access to sound reinforcement equipment that we do today, he'd be, you know, he'd be in charge of all kinds of, you know, uh, speaker systems and things like that. Um, but the biggest thing he did was to meld the acting, the drama, and the music and come up with this thing. Um, that he called this Gesamtkunstwerk, you know, and as a result, he was he was very very he he developed some very famous pieces, um, one of which is almost kind of ludicrously famous. Okay, it's from an opera that he wrote that I'm going to play a little bit of called Lohengrin. This isn't actually one of his more amazing operas. Um, the basic story is that there's a there's this area, uh, state, duchy, whatever, um, that was. Uh, uh, being kind of slid backwards into paganism by evil people. So God sends down this mysterious knight to rescue the kingdom from these pagan peoples. And um, the, the biggest problem is that, you know, the knight decreed that the only request he had, that no one should ask his name and he will rescue them. So they go, oh yeah, and he does a great job. And, um, you know, he falls in love with the with the, you know, the princess of the realm, Elsa, and she got married to him. But then she asks his name. Oh, my. 
And turns out his name is Parsifal. He's the guy that, you know, the Holy Grail Knight. So he says, oh, you did the bad thing. He left and goes off to the Grail Castle and she falls over dead. You know, that's a typical kind of Wagnerian ending, you know. But I want to play you um, a processional from Lohengrin and see if you recognize this. It's the wedding march. I bet you didn't know it had words, did you? Um, yeah, and look at these words. I mean, this is just over the top, you know, hardcore, weird, you know, uh, religious romanticism. Faithfully guided, draw near to where the blessing of love shall preserve you. You know, yeah, you know, this is this is kind of silly stuff, um, but. He he certainly know knew how to write a tune, you know, and he uh, he was famous for this, you know. People really, after after an initial difficulties, we'll talk about um, when we get to his life, um, you know, people really kind of caught into his music, as we say back in Indiana. Um, but I want to talk about another work of his that you may not have heard, but has had a profound, profound influence on music. It's an opera that he wrote called Tristan and Isolde. And it's about a love story, obviously, between Tristan and Isolde. <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, Tristan was the best friend of King Mark of Cornwall. He was sent to pick up Isolde from uh, Normandy, Brittany, one of those, and bring her back. And on the way, of course, they fell in love. And, you know, all this sort of stuff happens. And at the end, King Mark and Tristan kind of have it out. And uh, they all die. And Isolde just holds him and you know, typical Wagnerian ending. Um, but the thing that's astounding is what Wagner did musically to keep the tension going throughout this entire opera. And I'm going to play you um, what's called the Tristan Prelude. This is one of the most famous works in music academia. Um, and I'll talk about it in a second, but here's how it goes, okay? You hear how it's keeping the tension going with this music? You know, it's just kind of like, it's really, really not good. Something is, this is not going to be a happy opera, you know. And then finally you get to this point here, um, literally a minute in to the prelude, to the opening. Where it picks up that kind of swelling, that da 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 da, you know. Well, musically, this is a really interesting construction. Let me let me play you what what's going on there, okay? Uh, let me take it up an octave. Okay, this is what's bizarre. This chord right here has a name. It's called the Tristan chord because it's so musically ambiguous. Today, I mean, there's been thousands of dissertations written in music theory about that chord and how it can be resolved in any number of ways. You know, you can go...
But the way Tristan, the way that Wagner chooses to resolve it, keeps the tension going because he's going. To that chord right there, in the tonal system as it had developed up through the Romantic era, desperately wants to go here. It's called a 5-7 chord, you know. And if I play this... You hear it. It wants to go there. But Wagner resolves that weird Tristan chord to that 5-7 chord. And that is a chord that inherently has musical tension for us. You know, so he's able to really ratchet up the narrative, the tension of this narrative, you know, through this chord. And, you know, it, it, it actually, that particular, you know, that, that thing... That's called the yearning motif, and it's going to reappear again and again throughout the throughout the thing. Um, I just want to play a little bit of the ending. Okay, this is the famous aria from Tristan. You know, maybe you've heard it. Um, if you're a Wagner file, you certainly know this. Um, it's called um, Tristan's Liebestod, um, or her love of death. This is when Tristan has been killed and he's lying in Isolde's arms, like dying. And she sings this song, okay? Um, yeah. Milden, li Milden Liza, soft and gently, how he sleeps. You know, the guy's dying. Um, and this is just, this is just over the top Wagner. You know, this is a real sense of, of what his, what his operas are like. Okay. So here we go. Imagine the two figures on the stage, you know, She's holding him desperately, hoping he's, you know, peaceful, and this happens. You can hear how the music is just, you know, kind of swelling up and down. You know, John Adams, uh, John Adams, uh, John Williams, this is where he, he learned his playbook for all the music scores that he does. All those guys, Danny Elfman, everything, you know, they went to Wagner because he basically set the mold. And the music just breathes, you know. It's constantly commenting on, you know, being a part of the drama and the action, you know. And, and you get these intense kind of swells of emotion, you know, things like this that are, that are going to happen, you know. And in case you don't get it, he's going to do that again, you know, just to, to make sure you know it. You know, this is pretty intense stuff. You know, you're going to come out of this catharsized, I don't know, but, you know, after several hours of this, you know, it's just going to be, you're going to walk away just going, oh my goodness, I saw something there, you know. And just to make sure he knows, you know, that you're getting it, you know, at the very end. Is it going to be happy?
There it is. There's that yearning theme. But now, finally, it resolves. Oh, isn't death just bliss? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop this here and I'm going to set the next video. We're going to talk completely about um, the ring. Probably Wagner's, well, probably his, his greatest work.